Yes. Why uh, is everybody so polite? Why is it the one thing you can say anything about somebody's views on politics, but if you if you say anything about religion, it's uh, and I think, by the way, the, the discussions on the panel so far have been extraordinarily polite. I don't know whether it's politeness about religion or the politeness of women. What do you think? Um, <laughs> probably both. Um, but this has been uh, a, a question that's gotten some attention recently um, when fellow atheists have gone after religion um, and uh, have had to uh, defend themselves against, you know, that they're, they're so aggressive, you know, when you when you go after these false uh, beliefs. Now, even that, you know, just coming right out, and I'm saying false beliefs. There's a little side of me that's saying, how very rude. Why are you not? Uh, why are you not? Uh, you know, tolerating other people's positions on these things. But no, I mean, these are false beliefs, and it is uh, part of uh, our. It is part of being committed to rationality and to secularism and uh, certainly to philosophy to go after false beliefs and the arguments that support them. Well, let's say first of all, I mean, I mean, Sarah from Americans United, which is an organization I worked with for years and have great respect for. I believe, for example, that uh, secular people and religious people who have should work together on the same causes where their interests coincide. But I didn't agree, I don't agree that there is any danger of religion being made a scapegoat. Uh, I think, for example, this recent Supreme Court decision allowing not just prayer at the beginning of meetings, but sectarian prayer, which is far, far, much farther. All of the old school prayer decisions were about whether you could have a general prayer that just included belief in God. This was about a sectarian prayer, and the Supreme Court, by a five to four majority, said you could have a Christian prayer. I don't think in this environment that there's any danger of religion being, being made a scapegoat by whom? Uh, yes, if somebody says something in a book, basically, as far as atheists ever go in speaking ill of religion, is to speak ill of religion in books. I mean, when was the last time an atheist ever knocked on your door and you know asked you to convert to atheism? Oh, you know, we don't do we we don't do it. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But I think that if anything, you can say that in general. You can you can say it more about women and uh, and a lot a lot has been said about children and I'm not I think I've I've had it with homeschooling uh, uh, I don't want to hear any more about it but about about mothers and children there's something I was made aware of I wrote a piece for the New York Times uh, when President Obama appeared at Newtown after the Newtown shootings pointing out that he had talked about Jesus specifically and that he had talked about com you know, comfort in knowing that our loved ones are in heaven. I thought, well, not everybody in that audience who lost a child was either a Christian and probably not everybody in that audience was comforted by the idea that their dead, murdered child was in heaven and that he should have phrased it you know, more inclusively. Anyway, this article appeared in the Times and it was reprinted the next week in the Dallas Morning News. And I received on my author website an extraordinary number of letters from Texas atheists. One was, one was from a woman who lived in the suburbs of Dallas and she said, I'm an atheist and I have two children, but I haven't made this clear either to my children or in my community because they would surely be bullied at school if I were known to be an atheist and an activist. Well, the truth is, uh, I, I couldn't, I, I mean, I thought there may be, women may not be, they are more religious than men, but they may not be as much more religious than men as we think because a lot of women may be shutting up for that reason. Maybe if I lived in Dallas, I would too and I had children in school. Yeah, so we should um, probably back up and talk about the question of um, are women more religious uh, than men? I mean, there are statistics and they're cross-cultural yeah. uh, showing that you know women uh, do tend to be more religious. Or, uh, and um, I, I know many, 
mixed couples where it's the, the man who is the free thinker, the atheist, and it's the woman who is, uh, remains religious. And I think, you know, I, and, and this is cross-cultural, right? Yes. And it is very, very strong in South America. Uh, for example, big disparity between um, uh, women being far more religious and more active members of their uh, religious communities. And I'm curious about this, why this happens, especially since it came out earlier, you know, it, it was we, none of us need to be reminded of, but certainly came out. Uh, religion is often very bad for women um, and really reinforces uh, the disparities in power between men and women. So why? Do you have any views about this? Let's theorize for a while uh, or uh, about <laughs> why, what is it? Uh, why would women uh, well, well, let be drawn me, to religion? Let me tell you, when, when, when I was writing the Spirited Atheist column for the On Faith feature of Was the Washington Post, which no longer exists, the On Faith thing at the Washington yeah. Post, but the first question they posed to the panel was, why are women more religious than men? And I, I, I gave some theories, which, which I'll elaborate on, mm -hmm. but I immediately received a lot of comments from men with the answer. Women are stupider than men. Oh yes, and I, I and I can tell you that <laughs> yes. I that I received a lot of these comments, mm -hmm. and I was surprised. But I think I think one reason cross cultural is something I just alluded to, which yeah. is women have traditionally, in many cultures, uh, had the responsibility for the in home education, religious education of children. Not in all, uh, but even even in Judaism, in the home, the woman's rituals are the keeper. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I also think today in modern society, there there is another reason. There is still an enormous deficit in the science and math education of women and men. It is, and it is a fact that the more science people know, the less likely they are to be religious. And there is no question that the, 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 courses, the courses that women take in college are much less scientifically oriented than men. And I think to that degree, that also feeds into why, because it's not only across cultures, it's across educational levels too. Mm -hmm. In other words, educated women like highly educated men are less religious than poorly educated women. Women, but not as much less religious as you would think from mm -hmm. their education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even with women who have doctoral degrees, a lot more of them are religious than men. Well, a lot fewer women have doc and postdoctoral degrees in the sciences than men. I do think that has something to yeah. do with it. Well, it would be interesting if, in fact, um, part of the explanation for the disparity um, this educational disparity, fewer women being attracted to attracted to uh, hard sciences, to math, physics. They they are they are actually uh, equal in biology, yes. Um, but in the hard sciences, and I, actually philosophy has the same statistics as the hard sciences. Um, but um, whether the reason for that disparity links up in some interesting way with the the reason and the disparity in religiosity. Um, really, really speculating here in a vacuum, yeah. but that, you know, that the same, uh, okay, now I have to bring up um, the chimps because I, I bring up the chimps now at every opportunity I get. I spent January in Uganda uh, with a uh, primatologist, Richard Rangham from Harvard, um, who has been studying the same troop of chimps for the past 26 years. So he, he really knows these chimps, and I was fortunate enough to uh, go with him. And it just blew my mind in terms of the differences between male and, and, and females. Um, and every question that I take up now, somehow I'm thinking in terms of the chimps. Um, at the the male chimps, and he has a wonderful book that I like to uh, recommend called Demonic Males, Apes and the Origins of Violence. Gives you a lot of information right there. But um, male chimps are 
obsessed with dominance. Uh, they are dominating each other within the troop, dominating all the females. It's very hierarchical, and every uh, male, no matter how low he is in the male hierarchy, is higher than every female, no matter how high she is in the in the female hierarchy, and also in dominating, you know, uh, other troops. They're always going to war with each other, and they everything, all the posturing, everything that you know that you you see among male chimps. And but the very interesting thing about them is that they form political alliances, uh, strategic alliances, the male chimps, to get what they want. Uh, so you back a certain alpha male, and the alpha males are going, you know, when there's an opening in the spot for alpha male, and they're going at each other, so all the other male chimps all fall, fall, uh, form into alliances, and these are, gives them uh, reproductive uh, uh, um, advantages. The, the alpha male will then get his pick of the most fertile females, and but the ones who backed him will get the leftovers. Although they'll, they'll get their pick too, so it's all very strategic thinking and team thinking. The females have none of that. There's no. They're, they're closest. They don't team up with each other. They don't form alliances. Their closest um, uh, uh, relationships are with their babies, uh, and they don't even, you know, sort of team up together in, uh, in terms of trying to get their babies' uh, advantages. It's all, it's all, every female and do alone And they, they build altars to the gods? No, they don't, but, but, uh, but I'll tell you what, I mean, when the males, when, they, when one team wins, when they get their guy in or they, um, or they find a, a, a male chimp from another troop and they, they kill them, they tear them limb to limb, they do this kind of um, end zone dance. They're, they're all but giving each other high fives, the men, just sort of always you know, bonding together. And I think, to me, this explains so much about our behavior, uh, that the male sort of bonding together, teamwork, you're on my team, you're not on my team. Religion works very much that way in terms of um, uh, males. And females, it's kind of, it's a, a more, I don't know, a, a, a domesticating the universe, feeling at home in the universe, feeling very alone because you don't have uh, alliances. And uh, I just, I'm very obsessed with the chimps, and so I'm everything I'm seeing now in terms of the chimps, but I am wondering how much this has to do with uh, females, the kind of spirituality, as, as opposed to teamwork uh, that is involved in uh, women finding a home in religion, feeling comfortable in religion, uh, feeling uh, recognized, you know, if not in uh, their terrestrial life, you know, the Heavenly Father. Well, I don't know, <laughs> but but of course we're not chimps, and 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 but we are but, to a great extent. But we are, but we are, but we are to to a considerable extent. That's true. Yeah. But but because we, I, a lot of what goes on now, I think, is the fact is women women you see, for instance, women in business forming alliances of exactly the kind you're talking about now. And, and also, I think in religion, leaving aside, for example, the Catholic Church, in which the one thing Pope Francis has said he won't even consider is making women priests, which is interesting since, since he's taken at least publicly a softer line on other things, mm. is religion has also offered, not only in the home, but at the lower levels of religion, an area for, for women to exercise power too. Uh, uh, this is true in the Catholic Church, that, that women being the favorites of father and, and supporting the activities of the, of the church at the, at the mechanical level, but it is almost as though women do the housekeeping of the church. That's true. I mean, I mean there, there, there is a similarity there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't know. I think the, I think cross culturally, the, the cross cultural thing. Maybe there is some biology, but in a way, it's not useful to think about it because if we're going to, for instance, appeal to women and talk to them about how religion is bad for them, uh, they're. 
there's nothing there's nothing about biology that you know, you have to appeal to people's minds. You sure. can't appeal to their roles. I think it's always important uh, to know the explanations uh, in order to be able to. To, to deal with these things, and it, to me, this is—it's a real phenomenon. If you just cross culturally, um, uh, all these different religions, and even when you leave religion, um, when I'm thinking of so many uh, couples I know where uh, they're highly educated, um, and the women, you know, embrace this term spirituality uh, in the way that the men don't. That there is this uh, more into, you know, I don't. I, I don't want to start sounding like the people who wrote to you and say that w women are no. just dumber, no. right? But that there is uh, there is a different kind of uh, uh, thinking about these issues, and it's, it's, a lot I, of it is accommodation, and you know, and that is going to merge into why are women more polite okay? When but it comes I think there's religion. something important here, though. That while while the greater religiosity of women is cross cultural, this statement. And, and I'm going to say it because everybody was so polite this morning. The statement, I'm spiritual but not religious, makes me want to throw up. Uh, and, and the reason it makes me want to throw up, and you only hear it in America, it is not anything, anything you ever hear in Europe, for example, I'm spiritual but not religious, because what this sentence really means is, I'm not religious, I don't go to church, I'm not maybe religious in the way you recognize that I'm relig religion, but I am a good person. Mm. And this word mm. spiritual comes to stand for being a good person, just as people will talk about, about Relig about religion as a transcendent experience, as if, as if it were any different from what some people feel when they hear great music, or what I assume a scientist feels, you know, when they first unraveled the genetic code or the human genome. These things that inspire awe don't have to inspire awe because they're supernatural. Mm -hmm. But I'm spiritual but not religious is a particularly American and a particularly female way mm -hmm. of placating mm -hmm. while not quite lying about what you are. Mm -hmm. It implies a wrong, a wrong idea, which is that somehow, the, and a wrong idea biologically as well as intellectually, mm -hmm. that somehow what religious people or people who believe in eternal life call eternal soul, what, uh, psychologists will call consciousness often as a substitute for the soul. You, mm -hmm. You've been to conferences where you've heard them do it. It's all an attempt to, make, to say, this isn't all there is. There's something more to me than just this brain which is part of this body. And women are much more prone to it because it's acceptable, it's much more acceptable to other people to say, I'm spiritual but not religious. Do and you that, think that's the reason or do you think that, um, I mean, I would, I would be interested in exploring this more with people who say it. Uh, whether, in fact, you know, there is some sort of belief about the world and about themselves that lie behind it, and that it's not just, uh, you know, being the more uh, palatable way of saying um, I don't believe in God. I think there, there is. I think, I think you actually put your finger on it. There is a belief that one is more than simply, you know, an animal who knows. This that she's is an animal. The, yeah, it's, 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 yeah. It's, this is not enough. I have to be spiritual but not religious. Consciousness has to be something, if you want to put it in the way that I have heard. Actually, it's, 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 it's men who will use consciousness. Women use I'm spiritual but not religious. That there is something other than this brain, which is totally dependent both on the genes you were given, on the amount of oxygen that's going into it right now, that that isn't all there is, that there is something more to us, something, it is the, it is the evasive modern version that says we are more than the created, we were really created above the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Yeah. And I think for women, that social acceptability factors into that. I think that both women and men in America, as I said, I've never heard anyone in Europe say this at all because there's, there's, there's no shame in saying you're an atheist or you're an agnostic in mm -hmm. Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly there have been dualists in, among 
among male philosophers, Descartes to name one. Right? I mean people. People <laughs> are yes, walking right. around now. Yeah. <laughs> but there are, you know, certainly, as you say, there are people, you know, who talk about consciousness, the mystery of consciousness. Anyway, um, but that in itself would be, is, is interesting. If, it, if it's true that this spirituality connotes something more than just the scientific uh, description of what we are uh, and what explains us and that we're nothing more um, uh, than the combination of, of genes and environment. Um, if that is, if that's the belief about the cosmos uh, that, that is behind the word spirituality, um, that is, that does seem to suggest what I was suggesting before, that, that perhaps the disparity between women going into the hard sciences um, and describing themselves and being more religious or describing themselves as more spiritual, um, that there's some sort of connection there, that there is something about the way uh, women are thinking about themselves in the world uh, that doesn't uh, quite jive with the, with the acceptance of the scientific picture. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that I think that that's uh, that that's possible. Now, why should true. that be true? It's also, I mean, you see it. For example, when there the number of women in medical school now is is equal to the yeah. number of women and men. But the fields of medicine that women go into are very different. There's there remain very few female surgeons. Women tend to go into family medicine, and which is great, and obstetrics and gynecology. But there's probably a reason a reason a reason for that too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I just I, I in 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 a sense uh, why women are more religious than men, I don't know. But you know that could bring us to another question. And you all sort of you know skirted around on the leaving religion. Every almost everybody on that panel mentioned guilt. I was listening. Uh, I didn't. I never felt no, you guilty. didn't. You didn't. But no. almost almost everyone no. did. But I think that sex has something to do with it, and and maybe partly partly in the chimp way. I do I, I do think that uh, even for younger women, when I think of women my niece's age is in their twenties, uh, the idea that sexuality is more than the physical. Is, is truly, it is something that women tend to think and feel and expect out of their sex lives more than men. And I think some of this, some of this is in some way related to religiosity because it's not that when you when you read stories, I'm writing a book called A Secular History of Religious Conversion right now. and. And you do see men, of course, beginning with Augustine, talking about sexual guilt. But when you talk to women uh, worrying about boyfriends and sex and feeling guilt about not filling what is the female sexual role, mm -hmm. I do think makes it makes it harder to harder to leave to leave religion for women than mm -hmm. for men. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think that that is certainly uh, there. There's a part of that, and and the other part, which um, which I had briefly spoken about this morning, is there are many roots to religiosity, but certainly one of them that's been identified. Um, I'm thinking of the work of Jonathan Haidt right now is uh, a longing for for purity and a separation from our from our bodily cells, which of course. Um, is connected with uh, not only wanting purity, uh, but um, our own mortality. You know, we associate the body with, with death, and that is certainly also feeds into motivations for religion. Um, but, uh, you know, if in fact part of what it is to inhabit the body is to have sexual urges, and that when we are in the midst of sex when we're in the grip of it. Uh, we identify with our bodies. We are our bodies. There's something, you know, if, if that is the, the, a, a unpalatable idea, a disturbing idea, uh, that wants to be controlled. And the way yeah. that that often is controlled is to control women, cover them up, right? Modesty is such an important virtue in all of these, uh, of these religions. And of course, 
around. That induces, if there's already some shame, that induces so much more shame about having this female body, which has been, um, which is identified as the body. That is the body, the female body. You know, that you, you are nothing but that body, and uh, and it has to be controlled. Um, I mean, it's really an amazing thing how much I know from my own tradition how much modesty was promoted as the as the basic female virtue. Uh, well, the men sat and learned Talmud, right, and the women cover themselves up. Well, right? but also also the woman the woman is this is one of the reasons why the greater religiosity of women. There, there is one thing that's important, important in, in the history of religion, still important today in countries where religion is physically dangerous to women, which is, is this extreme modesty is not only a virtue in itself, it is the only way you can protect yourself mm -hmm. from men as predators. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't engage in this modesty, modesty and you are, say, raped, it is your fault. It is the it is your responsibility as the female to protect yourself from this. Now, again, someone this morning on your panel, I think, talked about. Uh, of course, now uh, all modern religions aren't like this, but mm -hmm. what I would argue is, and I in fact uh, I'm not in the childhood of my atheism, but and and I have many friends who are religious feminists, but I do feel sorry for them. Because what they are doing is they are completely changing their religion into something else, which is fine. And they, they don't want to go all the way. It's kind of a halfway house. So what they say is, what, what for instance, uh, a Muslim friend of mine says is, that isn't the real Islam. That isn't the real Judaism, meaning it's not the religion in which I was raised as I would like it to be. And that's fine, that's wonderful. And, and I agree that, uh, that uh, the, you know, the, more, the more flowers blooming, the better. Yeah. But it doesn't get to my way of thinking. All of the religions which are not dangerous to women, in which I would, I would, I would include Reform Judaism and Unitarianism and, and liberal Catholicism, a whole variety of them, to the degree that they are not dangerous to women is the degree to which they have been invaded by secular oh, ideas. Absolutely. That's yes. that's yes. what I would say. Yes. Absolutely uh, right. Yeah. Not yeah. not yeah. The, not the de not the degree to which the religion itself has changed, but the way that it has been forced to change by secular ideas. One of which is that women have rights. <laughs> Right. No, absolutely right. Yeah. So, um, you know, and this this has been going on uh, ever since the Enlightenment. It's not ju even in the uh, the less liberal branches of religion. Uh, you know, nobody is keeping slaves, despite Leviticus. Nobody is stoning the Sabbath observe, uh, desecrators. Nobody or very few would want to stone the homosexuals. I guess some still would. Well, some, some still would. Yes. But there has been, you know, movement so that even very, very religious people will read scripture now. Now I'm talking about uh, Judeo-Christian scripture um, and uh, interpret the, the, the more uh, morally offensive bits about slaves, about uh, you know, all sorts of things, right? Um, and so... And when did this happen? When did this start happening? It started happening when secular uh, values, secular reason, uh, took hold of uh, consciousness, to use the word in a non-pernicious way, and, uh, and forced religion to, to, to modernize and to liberalize. So it's, it's never, it's not coming within. I find this, I find this quite annoying when uh, people talk like, who was the guy who wrote the evolution of Religion, the uh, right, uh, W. R. He's a journalist. Anyway, what is his name? Robert Wright, I think. Yes. You know the evolution of religion. How religion has internally been getting more and more liberal. No, religion and, has uh, been forced. forced. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, completely ignoring that. When did these things happen? They started to happen during the age of the Enlightenment, and you know, and it it was coming from from the outside. So this is a complete you know, false reading of the history of the liberalization of religion. It doesn't happen on its own. And, you know, and, and, and of course, even, 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 more, even more after Darwin, when, when then 
real, some real facts and a real counter interpretation became, became accepted by educated people who then, if they didn't want to give up their religion, had to reconcile it. And, and I do think, I, I hate to keep going back to science, but I do think at this time, uh, the fact is all of that took place in 19th century Protestantism in America. And it took place almost entirely among men. There were very few women who participated in what was a wide-ranging debate between the most conservative forms of religion and free thinkers mm -hmm. about Darwinism. Women were, women were almost uh, out, of that, out of that debate. Well, maybe they were there and they just weren't listened to. Uh, maybe their voices were they didn't, recorded. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't. Well, they didn't write much about it, and there there were women like maybe Matilda. they did, and they didn't get published. No, well, but but of those, <laughs> Elizabeth Cady Stanton got published, and mm -hmm. she wrote nothing about evolution. Mm -hmm. Matilda mm -hmm. Jocelyn Gage got published, and she wrote nothing about evolution. Yeah, there, were, there were some women who did write about evolution, uh, but. Um, but you know, I mean, in general, women of the 19th century had a lot more trouble getting published. Uh, that's why so many women had to publish under male pseudonyms. Yeah, but I think I think in free thought literature of those women who were published, I think that you can gauge what their interests were from 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 what they, from what they published. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for instance, I I think it's it's fascinating that that in the free thought movement that Robert Ingersoll, a man, had, and he was about the only man who had so much more to say about contraception even, hmm. than, even than Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was a friend of his, did. Hmm. But maybe, again, there's this element of, of danger for women. You know, maybe, maybe for a woman to say it, even for somebody as feisty as Elizabeth mm -hmm. Cady Stanton, maybe it would have been more difficult for her yeah. to say something about it. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I mean, there were, I mean, there's, for example, there was Margaret Fuller, uh, early 19th century woman who was uh, um, uh, argue, arguing for, uh, certainly against uh, conventional religion. Um, there's a very good um, new biography out by uh, Megan Marshall, just won the Pulitzer in biography on, on Margaret Fuller, a very forward-looking woman. Also, you know, when women came out, and I think we still have this problem, when women come out very strongly and um, uh, un on unconventional uh, positions, they're often mocked, they're not taken seriously. I mean, we still, we still have this uh, going on. So imagine how, how it was, uh, you know, going backwards in time. I, I, I think there were a lot more uh, women uh, free thinkers uh, in the past and uh, then have been recorded, then come, come down to us. I would assume also that there are more women atheists today than appear in the statistics, So too. let's talk about that. Let's <laughs> talk about the real topic of our discussion, which is uh, when women do reach the position, uh, the philosophical position that we have reached, uh, why are they so much more polite about it? Uh, why are they, are they just more polite in general? Are we more sensitive towards other people's? I find myself sometimes when I'm well, talking to a believer and, um, you know, a male or female, and they're sort of laying it all out on the line, and I feel, um, I feel so, I don't know you know, somehow protective of them um, with their their beliefs. And I, I don't, I feel, you know, if I'm just going to go in there and just smash those beliefs, um, that would not be a good, th I don't, there, there is some, some part of me that feels, oh, you poor person, I, I want to well, protect you. Well, I, well, I don't want to smash you. Well, you, you, you shouldn't because there's nothing you could say that would smash their beliefs anyway. I, I never, for instance, whenever I'm invited to, to participate in a debate on the existence of God, unless somebody is offering really, really a lot of money, in which case I let my scruples go. I don't yeah. because I think it's ridiculous. It's not going... To, for me to debate somebody on the existence of God is not going to change the view of anybody in the audience. Oh, yes, it, it will. It no. will. Yes, there are the marginal people. You know, um, oh, I when don't agree. I, well, um, who was it who was sitting next to me? I think Sarah Jones. She, she mentioned Bertrand Russell's uh, Why I'm Not a Christian. Um, I had read that A book that is also. different. A book, well, a book is different than, than a debate. Yeah, no, but debates... 
people also read books because of the debates. No, I, I, I think you're wrong. I think yeah. that, that uh, there are people who are um, marginal, they're considering, especially if they're young, uh, and they're, um, what they hear in these debates uh, could change their mind. Um, so just, just as books can, why, why, why doesn't lived conversation have the same effect uh, that reading books do? In some sense, it's even more effective. For the because same reason the TV shows don't. People don't, people don't, uh, well, I, I, don't, I shouldn't say this since I do a lot of lecturing. Maybe you won't want to hear me. But, but I, don't think, I don't think it has the same effect. And I also, I also think, in, in this country at least, that 90% of the time when you speak, all right, you could say the other 10% is, 90% of the time you're speaking to people who already agree with you, which is again uh, a, char a characteristic of this country. But, 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 but that's why these debates are so good, because you know, the people who are coming, uh, you know, some believe, agree with uh, one person, some with the other. I think the mm -hmm. debates are really, um, I, I find them very useful. I, I personally don't want to do them. Uh, mm. But I, I think that they could probably be very, I think they are very, very useful. And well, I, would, I would be interested in um, polls taken before and after the debate. Uh, you know, has your mind been changed in any way? Are you less sure of your view uh, that you came in with? Uh, I was at a debate once, one of, one of those sponsored by that British guy that they did do, and only one person. So the one, one person said they changed their mind a little bit. One and all, is all of them, all of them <laughs> said, all of them said. What, what I tend to do when I get things from young people is, I tend to recommend a book to them, sometimes my own, and say I'd be, I, I would be happy to discuss this with you. But I don't think that it's just female protectiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another thing too, when I, I, and I do think, by the way, that talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, if they approach you, I feel that to be different from a debate. Mm -hmm. I, gave a, I gave a speech right after Freethinkers was published in 2004 at Augustana, College, which is a historically Lutheran college. Uh, it's a college that, that uh, it's half Catholic now, that religious parents send their kids to under the illusion that it's going to protect them from secular education. Unfortunately for the parents, like many of the historically religious colleges, as opposed to things like Jerry Falwell's things, they have, you get a good secular education exposure to a lot of point of view. And this boy came up to me, he was a freshman. He had wanted to be a minister when he came to Augustana. Now he wanted to become a teacher. And he said to me, I had talked about, about, it was entirely a speech about separation of church and state. And he said, I understand what you're saying, that this is necessary in a democratic society. But how can I really believe that that should be allowed when I know I have the truth? And I know. Uh, but I, I wasn't about to say to him, you idiot, because he wasn't an idiot. Mm -hmm. He was somebody who had been brainwashed his whole life, who was just beginning to be exposed to other ideas, of which my talk was one. I suggested a few books for him to read, and I said, I think you're going to find that you're going to have to spend some time answering that question for yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I, really, I really believe that. But, but I think that's a different thing than the, uh, oh yes, bring us a few, than, yeah. than the debate kind of thing. But I don't think I went easy on him because I was feeling motherly, although he was awfully sweet. <laughs> uh, yeah. Da, ah, does religion allow more space for emotionalism than secularism? And is the freedom to be emotional one of the few benefits of sexism as it has been historically expressed? Huh. Um, so does religion allow more expression? Uh, or or more space one, and, I, and, I, and I infer from this, yeah. is this the reason because women are more emotional creatures uh -huh. because women allows more space for emotionalism? I think, the, uh, I think the implicit thought here is is that women are more, more emotional. emotional than men, which is what a lot of people think. And, may, <laughs> and, and maybe true. Um, and maybe true. true, yes. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't think that that... The premise is true. I don't think that uh, religion uh, allows for more emotion than secularism, or even m for more 
expression of uh, emotion than uh, secularism does. Um, you know, after all, um, one of the things that we do have is uh, completely secular art, music, novels, poetry, uh, uh, dance. This is these are all uh, secular forms of um, um, uh, you know expressing emotion, expressing so much more, but certainly express, uh, expressing uh, emotion. And so you know, I, I there are. I, I guess I don't. I don't uh, buy the the premise of the of the uh, of the question. Um, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think it so either. I mean, I don't think that that religion allows more space for emotional expression than secularism. I do think, however, that many religious people believe that. I think. I think the perception of secularists. I have written this. I think that the perception of secularists as cold, passionless people ruled only by their brains and not their hearts, as if there weren't, weren't I, 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 not only do I think it, I've heard it from people, is, and, and I received many letters after, after I wrote the piece about Newtown, you know, saying, you know, what other way could the president comfort people except through religion? Well, there, there, there is a way in addition to religion to comfort people, which is uh, the idea, for instance, that a non-religious parent whose child was killed and was not feeling grief did not, did not need to be comforted and could be comforted by the idea that the child might, that, that, that the only way that you could comfort anyone, show your human empathy for them, show that you felt what they felt, was to mention Jesus Christ. I think that's flat out wrong. And I don't know, that was the great thing about Ingersoll, and I don't think we have had anybody like that uh, in today's society among the very good atheist speakers hmm. who conveys that warmth that human passion, the idea that religion, that that free thought, is good for people because it frees them. That it allows loving homes to be made, not because women are slaves. There's another one. Do you think women are more religious for the same reason slaves were? Uh, uh, not because of that, but that freedom, freedom, intellectual freedom, and reason bring bring relationships which are based more on equality and a sharing mm -hmm. than on than on the master uh, than yeah. on the master slave yeah. relationship yeah, yeah. so um, an another thing that that occurs to me as I, I'm amazed that I haven't mentioned it yet in this conference is uh, the great emphasis that I put on um, uh, Mattering, mattering in the world. Um, if any of you heard me speak uh, last year, it was all about uh, mattering and religion as um, as a way of feeling that one matters in the world. Um, and uh, you know, this is something actually the new book talks about this a, a great, a uh, great deal. And one of the ways in which this really came home to me was when I first came out as a as an atheist. I got so many emails and letters saying um, what what gets you out of bed in the morning like what you know, why why what what motivates you and I was at first so uh, taken aback uh, by this by this question it never occurred to me not to get up in the morning I have so much to do right <laughs> right it's like it's like and, and, and the one I loved was always it, it comes in on radio shows all the time. Uh, if you don't believe in God, what is to prevent you from committing murder? Well, there's that uh, one too, right? Over, yes. over yeah. and over, you know, yeah. as if the idea of committing murder was something that naturally occurs to you that has to be suppressed by religion. Or at least they, they could yeah. ask, why aren't you spending all your time at an orgy? That at least right. I, here, can, I can imagine. Here's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could, uh, could but the, the mattering thing, you know, the, it sort of occurred to me, what, what is motivating this question? And it it occurred to me, well, th there are people in the world who just f don't feel at all as if they matter in this life. They don't have, uh, they're not getting enough support. They're not getting, uh, th their lives just are lonely and um, 
uh, and they don't feel like they matter, and, but they feel like they matter to God. They feel like they matter in this cosmic way, and that this might be what was motivating uh, both this question that I kept getting, why, why, why do you even pursue your life? And it's like, why wouldn't I? Who, who else's life am I supposed to pursue? Obviously, I'm going to pursue my life and pursue it with everything I've got. Uh, but that I get, and you get, and many of us, I think, who have the courage of living secular lives, get a lot of reassurance that we matter, that we're doing work that matters, that we have relationships that matter. Um, and that, and this is why I do feel that that, that secular movement demands uh, that we also adjust issues of social justice, that when there is this inequity uh, among us, uh, you know, some of us feeling, not giving it a moment's thought, of course we live lives that matter, and many, but so many people not, and turning to religion uh, to fill that vacuum, and I think that's a lot of the force of the emotional uh, support for religion. Uh, it demands social justice. Yeah, Rebecca, here's an interesting question. When I came out as an atheist, my lifelong atheist Jewish husband was very upset because our children would, quote, lose their Jewish identity. Might part of the problems women experience entering the atheist humanist community be due to men relying on the religious involvement of women or as, as a social benefit? I would say absolutely yes. Yeah. More in Judaism than in some religions, but absolutely mm -hmm. yes. And particularly, mm -hmm. even relying on women to pass on what the men don't believe. I, could, I can give you an example of this because uh, my younger brother uh, died two years ago, so he's not alive or I wouldn't say this. Uh, I didn't know until a month before he died that he was an atheist because he'd sent his children to to Catholic instruction and so forth and so on, had them baptized. Uh, I couldn't be the godparent because I couldn't promise to bring up the child in the Catholic religion, which is what as a godparent in Christianity, you had, in Catholicism at least, you have to do. And I said to him, I said, so, so what was all this about baptism and communion and, and instruction if you're an atheist? And he said, I didn't feel that they should grow up without religion. And he relied on his wife, who I don't think is any more you know, religious than he is, to sort of make arrangements for all of this. Now this actually, those men who wrote me and said women are stupider than men, what could be stupider than that, than thinking that you ought to bring your kids up to believe something that you yourself don't believe? They were astonished when, 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 when in his last instructions were that he was to be cremated and not, not buried with a priest or anything like uh -huh, that. Uh -huh. uh, in other words, they had never known what their father thought about any of this, really. So I think that's a, I think that's a salient question mm -hmm. as, to why, as to why a man who was a Jewish atheist would want his wife to... Uh, I guess make the. I guess what he meant is, you know, she felt she wasn't going to do the seder anymore or anything like that. Mm. Well, one of the things, of course, about um, Jewish identity is when you when you stop practicing, um, you uh, I mean, you're still Jewish. There's no such thing really right. as being I, an ex-Jew. Um, I've tried. <laughs> I've really tried. Uh, they don't, you know, they, they really don't excommunicate you. Nothing you can do will make them excommunicate you. <laughs> we have about three minutes left, just so you know. Okay. Uh, okay, here's one. Uh, is it because women are more giving to, ma to and masochistic than men and religion reinforces this? Religion gives women a chance to be self-sacrificing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be. I, I, don't, I don't know. Well, it's I certainly don't know. true yeah. that religion would offer you the chance to be masochistic if, if that's what you wanted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, you know, and one more thing that we didn't discuss. I mean, there was the question of why do women seem cross-culturally to be more religious than men, even though religion is often not very good for them? Uh, why... Uh, why are they more polite when they come out um, and when when they're they're no longer believers? And the other question is, you know, why why do they are why are they less likely to join uh, free thinking atheist secular 
um, organizations. Rebecca, uh, here's a great question yeah. since we've just used Warren, which goes to just what you've said. Yeah. There can be an element of sociological privilege in who becomes an atheist, especially in public. Uh, is it likely that the smaller faction of female atheists is related to this expectation of dependence imposed on women? That a man who severs himself from religion is somehow less aberrant than a woman because we expect him to be independent in ways that we don't expect her to be. Mm -hmm. I think that's. I think that. That's I think there is. Uh, yeah. You know, and yeah. you know something when you when when you look at stories about the frontier and so on in small towns, there's always the village atheist is always a character, and the village atheist is always a man. Yeah. In the in these in, in, in and a whole also in these of folk front, stories. also in these frontier stories, and this is for the real yeah. thing in yeah. in our frontier yes. history. Yes. Um, the men were lawless. Uh, they were they were carousing and having a hell of a good time, and then the women, as they as moved west, they brought um, civilization and they brought the church, right? And so they, uh, even then, you know, in our history, in American history, uh, the women were the ones who, who brought the religion with them and, you know, get me to the church on I'm getting and, married and in the morning. And they were a, re a, reason, a reason also gave men, because men wanted access to these women, it gave them a reason to exercise social control. Exactly, I, yeah. That, so. that, that, I, that's a great question. I would just like to say one thing that I was just itching to say this morning when everybody was being so polite about male gender genital mutilation, which I call circumcision. I hate to disagree with Katha Pollitt, whom I admire enormously, but I don't think women get a vote here. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs>